Well, it's, uh, it's great to see you this morning. I uh, have enjoyed worshiping the Lord with you, and I'm really grateful that you're here and uh, gathered for the purpose of worship. The highest pinnacle of worship has always been that the people of God would hear the voice of God. And we do that through the gospel and music, through the gospel and the word and the preaching, the prayer and everything should be gospel focused. This morning, we're in Ephesians chapter number 5, and we're going to be studying verses 22 all the way to the end of the chapter. If, you, uh, if you've been around here or maybe you haven't, what we do, what our process is, is that we pick a book of Scripture and we walk through it systematically, verse by verse, line upon line, so that uh, we uh, do our best to hear and understand the Word of God as God has delivered it. As you know, in Ephesians chapter 5, the topic of marriage reigns. It's a very important, a very significant topic. And uh, I I, I plan to spend a couple of weeks here in Ephesians chapter 5 before we uh, move to chapter 6. Because systematically... He's dealing at this point with relationships, okay? He's going to deal with a husband and wife relationship. He's going to deal with uh, children and parent relationships. He's going to deal in our day and time with employer-employee relationships. And he's going he's to show us how to redeem our relationships, how to get them back out of the context of merely being another relationship in the world world and make them gospel centered. And so that's what uh, Ephesians chapter 5 focuses on. Remember now, Ephesians is all about who you are in Christ. And if you are who the Bible says you are in Jesus, then our relationships should reflect that reality. It should mirror the gospel truth as we live those practical applications out. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning there in verse number 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to, in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish, In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. If there's ever been a countercultural text, Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 to the end of the chapter is very counter-cultural. I don't know if you know or have noticed, but there is an institution that is fundamental to the existence of any culture, and that's the institution of the family. And standing at the center of the family is nothing less than marriage. And there's been no institution under greater assault in our culture than the institution of marriage. Marriage has become a punchline, a joke. <laughs> I uh, want to read a quote from Josh 
uh, Bice, I believe he, he said this, marriage has been hijacked by sitcom writers and many of our young people learn a false view of marriage through a screen as they watch movies and television sitcoms. They learn to laugh at it. They learn to disrespect it. They learn to disregard it. I believe he's got his finger on the pulse of where we are today. Statistically speaking, people who get married are fewer and fewer in our culture. Marriage rates have dropped over the last couple of decades. If those trends continue, it will be alarming as to where we arrive. At the same time that marriage rates have dropped, what we are finding is that younger people are deciding not to get married, but to live as though they were married without the covenant commitments of marriage. In fact, uh, living together, cohabitating, is up some 29% since 2007, which is, uh, you see how marriage is, is kind of in the decline, and, and cohabitation is on the incline, and you see kind of where our culture is, and what it says about our view of marriage. Now, the question you and I must ask today, does it really matter I mean, is all the fussing and moaning and wringing of hands over the issue of marriage, does it really matter? Or, or, or maybe, maybe we could all agree that it matters, but maybe the bigger question for you and me today is, well, why does it matter? Well, what is it that, that, that makes marriage so important? Is this just a cultural issue? And church, I want to tell you this morning that marriage is more than a cultural issue. Look at me now. Uh, hear me well. God has not called you to be a culture warrior. He's called you to be a Christian. And your task is different from fighting to preserve a culture or return a, a culture to what it once was. That is not the task of the church of Jesus Christ. We are about the gospel church. Our task has always been the great commission. And so when we talk about marriage, when we talk about the significance or the meaning or the importance of marriage, we really focus on one primary thing. In your notes, here's what I want you to write. Marriage is not primarily about a couple. It is primarily about the gospel. Marriage is not primarily about a couple. Marriage is primarily about the gospel. When you read this text in Ephesians, Paul drives us to one grand and glorious point. Why is marriage important? And Paul undergirds that and he shows us that marriage is important because it points us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. Marriage is a gospel picture. Look, look there in verses 31 and 32 again. So, so we just see the point before we step back and we ask how we should do our marriage. We need to step forward just a little bit and ask why marriage is significant. And Paul answers that right at the end of this text. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He quotes from Genesis chapter 2 there. And he brings marriage into the context of the church. And then he says in verse 32, this mystery, what mystery? The mystery of man and woman. The mystery of marriage points us to a greater mystery. A mystery that is so profound, Paul is saying. Look at verse 32 again. This mystery is profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This morning I want to tell you a news flash. Your marriage is not just about your happiness. Your marriage says something about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your marriage either clarifies the gospel or it confuses the gospel. But your marriage, in one way or the other, is an indicator, a gospel 
witness. And that's what he's reminding us of in this text. Danny Aiken, uh, preacher, uh, seminary professor, has a quote. I'll just read it to you. I think he's point on when he says this. Probably the most important biblical principle in relationship to the institution of marriage is that it is designed and intended to present something beyond itself, namely the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we walk down the aisle and when we say, I do, when our lives are joined together in the institution of marriage, what we're doing is we're giving a visual picture of the union between Christ and His blessed, beloved bride. Marriage should help point us to something beyond ourselves, something eternal, something profound, something so deeply, richly meaningful. In fact, in your notes, here's what I want you to write. Marriage visualizes the gospel union between Christ and His Bride. Marriage visualizes the gospel union between Christ and his bride. Now, with that understanding, church, do you understand why the institution is so under attack? It's not about our culture. It's not about us returning to a 1950s Mayberry mentality in the United States. That's not what marriage is about. You know what it's about? It's about communicating the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any of y'all have a perfect marriage? <laughs> Any of y'all ever uh, get off uh, in marriage on the wrong foot? Uh, I think I've shared my story with you before, but, uh, you know, when Christy married me, she pretty much married Prince Charming, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a romantic at heart. Uh, every girl's dream is to marry someone so thoughtful, so expressive. And uh, when, when we met, we met in church in a service not too different than this. It was during the, the welcome course. She turned around and shook hands with me and wow, how sparks flew. You know the story. You know how that goes. We dated a couple of years. Her dad was uh, a preacher. That was a little intimidating, to be honest with you, uh, because I knew what preacher's daughters were like because my mom was one. <laughs> uh, and so we, 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 you know, we had a relationship. Finally, I bought a ring. Oh, man, it was sweet. And to Red Lobster we went, which was the place that we had our first date, Red Lobster. I, I'll never forget when we had our first date there. So I took her there, back to a place that was unique and special to us. And if you don't know this about me, underneath this is the heart of a chicken. <laughs> it's just right there, it's a chicken. And I, I, I could not work up the nerve to get that ring out of my pocket and, and, and don a knee in that occasion and ask for her hand of marriage. And so as the time passed, dinner got away, it was time for us to leave, and leave we did. And so I found the opportunity to be more excellent on Ross Clark Circle. <laughs> right there at the intersection of the circle in 84, under the glow of the Krispy Kreme fresh hot sign, <laughs> pull the ring out of my pocket, look over at her while the light is changing to green. <laughs> and in those immortal words that every girl longs to hear, I said, well, will ya? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, will I what? <laughs> and I want to tell you something. I, it started out all wrong. I, 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 I we got a million stories about how we fumbled and how we faltered and how we've fallen. But God has redeemed our story. I, I, I tell you, when I prayed over this, this text this week, when I was working on it, I want to tell you something, it was working on me. I uh, got into bed 
I don't remember which night it was, just dealing with the text and text dealing with me. And I started talking to Christy and we we're having this conversation. And uh, she was like, what's going on with you? You know, what, what is it? And, and uh, to be honest with you, it was just God at work in my life. Because I realized that my ma- marriage should point my kids to Jesus. My marriage should point you to Jesus. My marriage should point people who don't know Jesus to Jesus. That's the point of my marriage. It's not just about us having a good relationship, though that's important. It's something bigger than that. You understand that marriage matters because the gospel matters. And this is fundamental to what Paul is emphasizing in this text. He wants us to have a big picture of marriage, a high view of marriage, because marriage pictures and points us to something that is so profoundly important. Here's my contention to you this morning. Your marriage either clarifies the gospel or it confuses the gospel. It does one of those two things. It gives a visual illustration of Jesus' love for his bride and his bride's commitment to his Lord, or it doesn't. This morning, I believe that God is calling us to something. And I know some of you are out there and go, well, this doesn't really apply to me. I'm not married, I'm single, or I'm single again, or I'm just not where you are in this text. And I just want to say this, hear my heart in this. Paul is not writing the book of Ephesians to a segment of the church at this point. He's speaking to the whole church body. And what he's saying is that everybody plays a part in marriage. Whether you're married now or whether you're just a part of the body of Christ, everybody's job is important to clarify the gospel as it relates to our marriage. So let's, let's just do some, some cursory understandings, some, some things we got to get in order to understand marriage. And we'll get specific or more specific next week. But, but some of the things we just got to say, here's, here's the first thing. Here's what I want you to write. Marriage is the joining of man and woman into a one flesh union. Marriage is the joining of man and woman into a one flesh union. This is, what, uh, this is what the text teaches. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So, when our culture says, no, marriage is not this, it's this, When our culture says, no, marriage doesn't look like this, it looks like two people in love, what we do is we come back to the source of our authority. Now, church, let me ask you a question. What is the source of our authority on marriage? It's God, is it not? Look, marriage is not a human institution. God is the one who gave us marriage to begin with. You go back to the garden, and what do you find? Adam and Eve there. And guess who puts those two together? It's God. God creates marriage. And so if marriage is to function, it's to function God's way. And so God sets the parameters for what marriage is and is not. And look at me this morning. God is the one who defines marriage. It doesn't matter what popular opinion says. God is the ultimate source of authority. And if it rubs culture the wrong way, then culture's wrong, not the Word of God. We don't need to change the Word because God has spoken definitively and defined marriage. So, when we talk about issues of marriage, by the way, (laughs) we have to, in our day and time, we have to speak about issues of gender. This is a point of controversy and a point of confusion. And it seems obvious to us, but but we have to say it in our day and time. The church needs to be exactly clear on what we believe marriage is and what it's not. And that's not to condemn people, okay? We don't have a, a condemnation mentality. We need to clarify because marriage must be defined as God defines it because the gospel's at stake and linked to marriage. Are y'all following with me this morning? 
All right, all right. So you're, you're with me. You're tracking with me there. So here's, here's what I want you to write in, in your notes. Biological gender is a product of God's good and wise design. Biological gender, when he talks about husband and wife, he's speaking of male and female, man and woman. He's talking about biology. He's not talking about how you feel. He's talking about how you were made. God made gender, and gender is not bad. It's good, and there's a lot of confusion around that. Listen to Matthew chapter 19, verse number 4. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them what? Male and what? Who did that? God did that, church. We're just naive enough to believe that God got it right. Gender is a product, not of a a feeling, but a biological creation that God has made. And so we believe that God is very clear on this issue. Biology, biological gender is a product of God's good and wise design. Here's the next thing I want you to to think about and, and, and notate. God created all men and women in his image with equal dignity. Look, men, you are not superior in your value to women. Ladies, you are not inferior in your value to men. God made man and woman in his image, that means we have equal value and dignity. Can I get a witness on that? Look, the Bible affirms that everywhere. Fallen humanity has messed that up in ways that we can't even begin to describe and imagine today. But fallen humanity's messed that up, but the scriptures affirm the equal dignity between man and woman, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse number 27. So God created man in his own image. Listen to this. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so God created all men and women in his image with equal dignity. But we must. Nothing- We necessarily must take another step because that's not the end of the story. God created all men and women in his image with purposeful differences. Men, did you know that ladies are different? Maybe I asked that the wrong way. Ladies, do y'all know that men are different? (laughs) That that just sounds so obvious, but, but that's where we are today. It's, there's been so much confusion and so much rhetoric on this topic that there's been a blurring of the lines between what is and what is not. And the Bible reminds us over and over again that God made us equal in dignity, but he certainly made us different. And that is true. Different, in fact, we are different by design. We're different by design. I love what Elizabeth Elliot said. If you, if you uh, ever read somebody on this topic, Elizabeth Elliot is amazing. Listen to what she said. Throughout the millennia of human history, up until the past two decades or so, people took for granted that the differences between men and women were so obvious as to need no comment. They accepted the way things were. But our easy assumptions have been assailed and confused. We have lost our bearings in a fog of rhetoric about something called equality. So that I find myself in the uncomfortable position of having to belabor to educate people what once was perfectly obvious to the simplest peasant. You know what I say to that? She is spot on. Listen to me. If marriage is going to work, it's going to work by God's design. And God designed marriage to be between one man and one woman. That was his design from the very beginning. And can I just say this? 
that God knows more than man. And when we try to re-engineer things, we really mess it up. God's design was perfect from the beginning. That's the emphasis here. God designed us to work together biologically, physiologically, emotionally. God put us together so that we could be one. That's the emphasis and the focus in this. And so, while there is equal dignity, there are different roles of responsibility. This gets controversial, right? Everybody goes, oh me, here we go, here we go. He's, di- he's jumping in the deep end, right? But, but, but God made us different, and he gives us differences purposefully, so that there are different roles that we should fulfill. When you read Ephesians chapter 5, beginning there in verse 22, about marriage and responsibility and roles, one thing that you're struck with is that men, he gives you more responsibility. In fact, you just look at the length of text that's addressing men in these two uh, groups, and you know that the weight of the responsibility falls on our shoulders. Men, you have a big responsibility. Marriage matters, and you and I must step up. In fact, in your notes, here's what I want you to write. Man's biblical responsibility in the home is headship. God has called you husbands to lead your home. He's called you to stand in front and to give loving sacrificial leadership to your home. And the analogy that he plays off of is the analogy of the leadership that Christ gives the bride, his church, that leadership, that loving leadership, that sacrificial leadership that Christ gives to his church. Look at verse 23 there in in the text, Ephesians 5. For the husband is the head, that's the headship, leadership. Authority in the home. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Look look at verse 25 there uh, in in chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So, So leadership looks like self sacrifice. Leadership looks like sacrifice. Do do you understand that? How does Jesus lead his church? He gave himself up for his church. Christy and I were in in New Brockton when I was pastor there. There was a couple in our church who had an adult-aged daughter, and they had grandchildren. This adult-aged daughter came down with a, a debilitating illness. I think it may have been Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig's disease entered her life and took literally every bit of physical strength from her. She basically was helpless. Couldn't lift her arms, couldn't move her legs, couldn't bathe her body, couldn't feed her mouth. She couldn't do anything. Years rolled by in this condition. And finally, finally her husband broke. And he broke off the marriage. And he walked away. I'll never forget those parents wrestling through the implications of this man who stood in front of a congregation like this and said, for better or worse, for sicknesses and health, until death do we part. And I'll never forget, as those parents are grappling with that that, that kind of tension that was in the air, and how he walks away. You know what he was saying? He was saying, not really for better or worse. He was really saying, as long as my needs are met. Look, do you understand how that distorts the purity of the gospel? The gospel says Jesus is going to stick with you. He will never leave you, and he will never what? He will never forsake you. And marriage is to point us to that. 
a sticking together that says, you know what? This is not about me. <laughs> you know what? You know what I find? In my marriage, God brought me to this as a, as a personal reminder this week. That I insert too much of myself into my marriage. And Jesus has not called me to come and get. He's called me to come and give. Gentlemen, this morning in marriage, that's what Jesus is calling you to do. What does love look like for men? Here it is. It looks like a cross. Love looks like a cross where we give ourselves away for the good of our bride. That's the call of marriage. Do I love my wife? Like Jesus loves the church. Gentlemen, I want to tell you something. I submit to you this morning that that is the call of the Lord Jesus Christ to your life. It's to love like Jesus loved. It's to give yourself away. It's to do for her good. It's to care for her and serve her and sacrifice for her. It's to... Put yourself out so that she might be put forward. That's what the biblical definition of love looks like. It looks like a cross. Let's go to the next section here. Here's what you ladies need to know. The woman's biblical responsibility in the home is helper. Headship and helper, that's biblical terminology. In fact, Genesis chapter 2, he says this, And the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Look, look, in our culture, that doesn't sound very appropriate. It doesn't sound very hip. It sounds kind of like a bad word, but it's not. It's a beautiful word. It's interesting, in, in Scripture, the Holy Spirit is called the helper. Here's what I found out in my marriage. I found out I really do need my wife. When she goes away on a trip, I find out just how much I need my wife. <laughs> 21 years later, when I said I do... I didn't realize the good gift that God was giving me. He was giving me a treasure. He was giving me someone to help complete all that I need to be completing. And the truth is, what I'm hoping is that the way I respond to her and treat her and love her and lean into her life and lead her would somehow reflect Christ and his leadership and his love and his service and his sacrifice of his church. Herschel York is a professor of preaching and theology up at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Lectures a lot, speaks a lot, preaches a lot. I heard him tell a story about he and his wife uh, of many years. They've been married uh, almost 50 years, I believe. They're on a vacation. Uh, I believe it was uh, in, uh, in uh, Maui, Hawaii. He said, we were by the pool, and we were hanging out, and we were loving on each other, and we are just enjoying each other. And he said, there was this homosexual couple that was seated beside us. He said, we struck up a conversation because I try to be intentionally gospel-centered and reach out to people, not rejecting them, but loving them and teaching them the gospel. And he said, we struck up a conversation. We began to share our story. We listened to their story. And, and, and finally, after several days, they were kind of building a relationship and friendship with this, this homosexual couple. He said, finally, they looked at us and said, what is your secret? What is the secret to your relationship? How have you done it for these many decades? How have you kept the fires hot? How have you kindled the relationship and kept it going? He said, oh, you don't want to know that. He said, yeah, yeah, we do. We, this homosexual couple said, we really do. We want to know your secret. He said, our secret is that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That we've given our lives to Jesus and we've given our marriage to Jesus. 
And we want our marriage to model what Jesus has done for us. And the guy said, well, in the couple, he said, well, what do you do? He said, I don't want to tell you what I do. And he said, he said, go ahead and tell me. He said, no, if I tell you what I'll do, you'll judge me. <laughs> he said, I won't judge you. I would never judge. He said, I'm a Baptist preacher. <laughs> he said, their eyes got that big around. <laughs> he said, you can't imagine how God has used my marriage as a gospel track to share the glories of the gospel with people who do not know Jesus. This morning, hearing those words and being reminded of them afresh and anew, that's what I want my marriage to be. A picture of Christ and His bride. A picture that points people to Jesus. A picture that clarifies the gospel, not confuses the gospel. And that's our call this morning. For every person in this room, whether you're married or whether you're single, marriage is a gospel issue, and it matters to every one of us. We're all in this relationship together. And the only way that marriage works is that if we're filled by the Spirit of God. Will you bow your heads with me this morning? If you're sitting under the sound of my voice and you're married or one day you're going to be married, here's my plea to you. That this morning you would say, God, holy God, help my marriage to clarify the gospel, not confuse it. Help my marriage to clarify the gospel not confuse the gospel. Help my part in marriage, whether it's headship, whether it's helper, whatever role you've assigned me to, God. Help me to do that so people see what Jesus did for sinners like you and me. This morning, would you pray? Maybe maybe some of you men just need to come to this altar and say, God, help my marriage to be a gospel track so that others read it and know about Jesus. Maybe some of you wives, you need to come forward and you say, help my marriage to become all that Christ calls it to be. Maybe maybe some of you single people need to come and you just need to pray, God, help me to think about marriage differently. Not just about what it is in relationship to a man and a woman, but the gospel and what's at stake in it. Friend, I really do believe that God wants to shape our culture through the gospel of Jesus Christ, through the beautiful reflection of marriage. Father, have your will and way in this time together. And this subject that is, Lord, so challenging and difficult, I pray that you would bring clarity to us in an age of confusion and chaos. Help us to stick with your standard. Do a work here this morning. Call us to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? This altar is open. And I'm just going to ask you to deal and do business with God this morning. As he leads and directs you, you do business as we see. Oh, how he loves.